Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, and welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today with me, I have Johnny Reinch, CEO of Quill, coming to us from San Francisco. How's your day going, Johnny? It's going great. How are you, Nathan? Very good. Very good. Ready for the weekend, but, uh, but you know, it's a bright, sunny day here in San Francisco, so life is good. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so, what is Quill, and how'd you come up with this idea? Sure. Um, Quill empowers fr- freelancers all over the world with instant and very convenient access to credit. One of the biggest pain points that you have as a freelancer, which actually, let me step back. Have you actually been a, a freelancer before? Um, e- I have been a consultant. I don't know if that counts. Right. And so do you ever, do you remember having to wait for your contract to get paid? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And typically that's like on a net 30 or net 60, depending on sort of who you're, you're consulting for. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what Quill does, what we're very, very good at is taking that contract and once you've finished and submitted your invoice, we'll make an advance to you right on the spot. And on top of that, so we'll also, based on the data that we have, we'll try and estimate when we think you're going to get paid. So you can make, you know, you can do the math in your head of, um, okay, so for, I'll wait 30 days for a thousand dollars or I'll take 990 of it today and I can then go deploy that capital and, and, you know, build the business. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what we do. Make it very, very easy for freelancers to get cash. Interesting. I mean, I guess it's the, the old school equivalent is the payday loans kind of, uh, yeah. Although we've, we don't charge interest. So, um, we do a flat fee and that's it. That's all you'll ever pay. In fact, we go and do the collection stuff for you as well. Oh. Uh, if we, if we can't collect on it, we don't come after you as a borrower. Uh, we go after the, the person that, you know, signed your contract and is, and is not paying up. Is the fee a flat fee or a percent of the, uh, amount that I'm getting in advanced? Uh, it's usually a percentage, but it depends. Um, we do do flat fees for certain types. It just all depends on how we underwrite it. Interesting. Interesting. And I guess for freelancers, I mean... With small businesses, there's always that cash flow cycle issues. With, with freelancers, I guess you've identified the same problem of you know cash flow cycles. Yeah, actually, um, I had I experienced it firsthand. Um, I used to be an M and A lawyer, and when I made the jump um, and took off the golden handcuffs, you know, I still had the expenses that went along with the golden handcuffs, so they're you know sort of attached. So I was doing a lot of freelance jobs on the side. One in particular was a very high value job and um, they were late on paying me. And as a result of them being late, I was just about to overdraw in my bank account the day before my mortgage was going to become due, my mortgage payment. So I had to go and you know, like tap them on the shoulder. I had to go hunt down the finance person and get them to send my wire. And I got the money in the account just in time. Um, and that was sort of an in your face, like, why does it have to work this way? And the, the options would have been a predatory loan where I would have paid, you know, like 300% APR or something crazy. Um, and there are three basic reasons why a freelancer is going to take an advance. My favorite one is the cash that they're going to uh, get from the advance, they're going to put directly back into the, the business. So, for instance, an app developer might go buy Facebook ads and mm-hmm. that results in more traffic and more downloads and ultimately better ROI. Um, a high-end freelancer that is working on a team, let's say an agency, they might go get another sub- subcontractor so that they can land that big ass contract mm. with Apple, for yep. instance. Yeah. Um, and then the, the two other reasons are one, uh, unforeseen expense. It happens all the time. Like I'm pretty sure you probably spent last weekend figuring out your taxes, uh, like, like most everyone, um, around tax time and freelancers pay quarterly, you know, sometimes you get a black eye tax bill and you don't have the, the cash to do it. We're there to help. Uh, and then the last one is purely consumptive. Some people just want to have cash now. Mm-hmm. That simple. Interesting. Do you call yourself a, a factoring factoring for freelancers or do you not like that term? 
we, that's the model we use. Uh -huh. And I, I don't dislike it at all. It's just a lot of people don't know what factoring is. So if you say, I'm a, I'm factoring for freelancers, people's eyes kind of glaze over and, and they have no idea what you do. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Interesting business. Yeah, I love it. I, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. We had a, a, a guy um, from a pawn, an online pawn startup not too long ago. And that's not in the same exact category, but in some ways kind of interesting. And we're seeing these startups sort of, you know, shake up these old models. And I think you're in that category, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah. And like the main thing that differentiates us from the old school and um, like the banks that still do factoring is still alive and well in traditional finance and in commercial finance. The main difference is we can underwrite much, much better. And so we're essentially sending you an offer the split second after you've had a contract approved and a payment that's going to be due. We've already done the underwriting and all that stuff. So literally like from the, the split second that a freelancer submits their contract ostensibly, they could be funded, you know, within about a minute hmm. through our product versus go to Wells Fargo and, or somewhere else. And you'll go through months of paperwork and then you'll have these crazy drawdown schemes and all these various like, asset attachments we don't do any of that stuff we just make it super simple mm, interesting cool um so let's talk about money how much have you guys raised and how many how many rounds so we've done uh, a seed round and a series a round and we've done uh, that's equity and we've done three different debt rounds uh one for two million one for 50 million and uh, the most recent for 102 million Amazing. Um, cool. All right. Let's take it maybe chronologically. So tell me about the seed round. I think <laughs> I saw you were in 500 startups. Is that where you got, got the start? Yeah. Um, actually, our first real like anchor uh, was from uh, was this venture capitalist named Alireza Mazur from Plug and Play um, down in, in Sunnyvale. And he anchored 500K in what you might call our, our pre-seed round. And, um, you know, he was our early champion. And essentially, once he got conviction, you know, 500K just came in the door on top of their, I think it was like uh, 100K check. Um, and that was great. Put us in front of people that helped us with pitch practice, put us in front of corporates for distribution. A lot of lot great perks that came out of that. Um, I met Sheil from 500 Sheila note, who's the partner that runs the, uh, the FinTech track at 500 mm. startups. Mm -hmm. I met him a few months after we had done that 500 K and like 500 K for a highly regulated industry is not a lot of money to, to precede. So he, I didn't really want to do an accelerator. I was kind of like, you know, we're all, you know, fairly seasoned. I used to be an M and a lawyer. I was upper management at Zappo, one of the best funded Bitcoin startups. Mm. Um, both of my co-founders similarly are, are, you know, very highly skilled. And so Shield came out and, and he was kind of like, you guys should join the track. It'll be great. You know, we'll help you with uh, raising money and all this stuff. And I was like, dude, I don't really need to join an accelerator. Uh, we kind of understand what we're doing. And he was like, you know, I don't, I don't really think you did it. Um, like I'll help you get debt. And I'll help you deal with regulatory. And based on that pitch, and I remember we did this breakfast where, you know, it was like the second time I had ever talked to him. And he knew exactly what concerns I had at the top of my head. Um, in front of my mind constantly, it was like, man, we don't have enough money to grow uh, because we don't have enough money to advance to freelancers. And mm -hmm. regulatory is going to become a big issue because we're flirting with a bunch of highly regulated industries. Yep. Um, and as soon as he said that, I was like, all right, we'll do it. And the, the batch actually started literally the next day, and we, we joined 500. And true to form, um, once we had sort of like 500 on top of the fact that um, the fintech track in particular is great for fintech companies, um, it gives a little stamp of approval on you because it's a very well-known accelerator and, and a great feeder into uh, some of the great VCs that we have out in, uh, in, in the Valley and in San Francisco. And so, you know, once we had that stamp, it was kind of off to the races and like SVB came out of the woodwork and they gave us our first, you know, credit line for, for 2 million bucks. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, our initial, that 50 million round that, that I mentioned, uh, that was from a hedge fund. That was a personal contact of Shields and 
you know, they loved our model and they back, they bankrolled us before we were even fully live. Like we were in beta essentially. And we didn't have enough volume to satisfy that whole line, but they're like, this is what we'll backstop you for. So uh, it was very, very, and, um, you know, similarly, we, uh, on the regulatory side, we got to meet the CFPB and various compliance and, and regulatory folks on that side of the house too. So super, super helpful. It, so this is, I, I didn't know 500 Starbs had a dedicated FinTech uh, track. This was its own cohort or was it part of their regular cohort or what, what's the deal? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a track within the the broader cohort, and uh, we were batch sixteen, which was like, I think it was fifty four companies, and the um, the fintech track specifically was eight or nine. I gotcha. Okay, and do they yeah. do you know if so they we're do a, this? We're uh, a subset within it. Okay, gotcha. Do they do that with every batch? Were there multiple tracks within the batches, or yeah? Okay. Ever since Shield joined, we were the first one. So batch sixteen was the first batch that had a fintech specific track. And they've done one ever, ever since. Very interesting. And I'm sorry, and Sheel is his first name? Who? Yeah. S-H-E-E-L, just if anyone wants to like Google this person. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, Sheel Manote. And then if you look on my LinkedIn, like I talk about him, talk about him all the time. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good to know. I mean, this is I, I love being able to point people towards, you know, certain resources or things to check out. So that's great. Cool. So, and then with plug and play, I mean, did you go through plug and play also, or that was just Ali Reyes uh, putting in money from plug and play? That was just them putting in money through their their venture arm. How did you get connected with Ali Reza? It sounded like, like that happened before five hundred startups. Yeah, actually, it was before five hundred. Um, actually, a, a very good friend uh, and former colleague from Zappo. He used to work for Ali Reza at plug and play, and he knew what we were doing because I left Zappo to start Quill. And he was like, you know, Ali Reyes is one of the most helpful guys in the Valley. You've got to meet him. Met him, we hit it off, and, and the rest is history. Cool. But cool. That, that warm intro was pretty key. Um, and in general, I found that some of the best, most impactful relationships that you'll have with investors do come through a warm intro. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so that was Seed. And then after that, you uh, you launched the business. And I guess let's... Um, Scoot up a bit. Your next round is the Series A that was fairly recently, correct? Yep. And so our Series A was a total of five million bucks, and uh, we we did what I like to call the Sand Hill Shuffle, uh, which is <laughs> you go um, speed date, you know, uh, uh, tens of people that are potential employees that you can't fire, which is an investor. It's a really important relationship. Um, and did the whole thing and met a, a ton of really great ones um, and ultimately landed on a fintech specific investor based in San Francisco, uh, Mosaic. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, uh, I actually put a post on LinkedIn today about the investor types, but um, I have a, a bit, an affinity for um, investors with operational experience. And for one, they kind of get what you're going through. Like when you have a problem, it's like, well, why didn't you make 10 hires? They know, well, okay, it's really hard to hire 10 people really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, or like what happened on the P&L here? They've, they've seen it. They, they get it. Um, and so Miles and Howard from Mosaic, um, they're both operators and both operators within FinTech um, and like very, very large payments companies is, mm. is their experience. So aside from the fact that they have operational experience, they also are deep in operational experience in our industry. Um, and we also just hit it off from, from day one. So it was that, um, that perfect alignment that it is so rare and amazing when you have it that, you know, you just, you jump on, you jump on it and go all in. So yeah. I've got, um, I've got these investors now, employees that I can't fire, but I wouldn't want to, which is awesome. <laughs> employees that I can't fire. That's a good, I've never heard investors <laughs> being referred to as that but i like that that's uh, i like that um cool and how'd you get in touch with mosaic was that through 500 startups or through uh you know previous investors or did you identify them by googling fintech investors or you know how'd you how'd you find them i've never heard of them no actually yeah actually this was another um warm intro um so one of our our early early supporters and great partners was silicon valley bank 
and to this day um, is still Silicon Valley Bank. Um, and the lead over there, actually, I, it's hard to say who is the lead for us because we have so many different, you know, they have so many tentacles into us from a relationship standpoint, my mortgage included. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Ratika uh, in their payments group uh, is good friends with the Mosaic guys. And they also, uh, I think they uh, have invested in companies together as co-investors before and recommend that I speak with them based on sort of her understanding of our business and how deep that SVB has gone on our business. And so there we go. Another super warm intro where ultimately, even though I went out and talked to many, many others, it ended up being the right one. Yeah, no, it's interesting. How many investors did you talk to for your series A? Do you think, what was your funnel looking like? Uh, for seed, it was like over a hundred. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's you're playing the numbers game, especially in a highly regulated industry. Um, uh, for A, uh, was able to cut that by a factor, so you know probably tens of folks that I was actually seriously interested in in working with. Yeah. Okay. And a few of these other folks, also I'm not too familiar with, like Cantos and uh, Ranch Ventures. Are they also fintech investors, or are they s something else? Cantos, there's a funny story there. So um, Cantos is a, a micro VC fund run by um, um, my now very good friend, Ian. And he is probably one of the most hardest working VCs in, in, in the business. Um, he actually reached out to me after 500, um, you know, essentially saying, hey, I want to be helpful. And ultimately, uh, we ended up just hitting it off. And um, also, I'm a pretty big sci-fi nerd. So... Contos uh, is what uh, there's this book by Dan Simmons called Hyperion and it's a whole series and it's probably my favorite sci-fi series. And so when I, when I first met him, uh, he didn't come to me under the, the Contos mo moniker. He came to me just as Ian. And <laughs> when he sent me his sick page for the investment that he wanted to do in the seed round, it said Contos VC. And I was like, wait, um, you mean like the Hyperion Contos? He's like, yeah, of course. And <laughs> <laughs> two sci-fi nerds um, came together uh, uh, over over Quill. That's so. funny. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and then Ranch is actually he's uh, 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 the fund is again another micro fund, another super well connected micro VC that is again very very impactful and helpful. Cool. Yeah. Great. Did you see Ready Player One yet? I did. Actually, I saw it with Ian. Uh huh. What do you think of it? I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Did you like it? Uh, I thought I thought it was fun. Uh, I really liked the book, and I don't think the movie does the book justice in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the deviations are pretty atrocious, but um, <laughs> it, it was super entertaining, so I, I highly recommend it. I'm reading the book right now. I'm late to the, the game, but uh, that's the first book I've read in a long time, too, <laughs> sadly. Nice. That's a um, great book. No, it's a fun. super fun book. Cool, cool, cool. Let's talk about the debt side of that. So, I mean, you're – you have to raise these large amounts, first the 50 from the hedge fund, then more recently the 102. Is that – how does this structured? So is uh, – how, how is it structured? Let me just leave it open like that. Sure. So um, the interesting thing about how debt markets work is they're highly inefficient. Um, typically, you know, you would draw on an all-asset lien baseline and, you know, you would say, okay – um, I want to draw $10 million because I think my volume is going to be X. Um, we didn't structure it that way. So ours is the way that Quill system works is we can underwrite an advance that's, you know, um, $5 in the same way that we can underwrite an advance that's going to be $5 million. So because we're that good, our capital has to be really flexible. Mm. And the advances themselves are very rapid fire. So the way that the Route 66 line works, uh, which is pretty innovative from a financial services standpoint, is we prove our borrowing base and draw based on every single advance that's firing off through the system on a daily basis. So it's thousands. And it's all settling and going through and turning over on, um, for that line, a weekly basis. But from a capital efficiency standpoint, it's way better than that first type that I, you know, like the, the all asset lean that, um, that, that I recommend or that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we put, put this together specifically for Quill and they were one of the, re that was one of the reasons why I really liked route 66 is that they were able to innovate on the lending model in a way that 
um, really no other lender could. Sorry, Route 66 did the 102 million. Correct. Thing? Okay, gotcha. And they're yeah. I'm not, they're a uh, a bank, a hedge fund, or what's what's their actual uh, title? Would you call them? They're a VC fund that has um, a, a pretty substantial credit arm. Okay. In fact, I think the most of uh, of their business runs through the credit side of the house. Uh, but they're a very well known uh, fintech VC investor as well. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, and so, so bear with me uh, as I connect these dots in my sometimes slow computer. But the 102 million—that's something you can draw down from, or you actually have that in the bank to make out the the loans using. Do you know what I'm saying? What I'm asking? Yeah, no, we we draw it, and it, it's actually a pretty complicated way of uh, of running stuff. But essentially, it keeps it off of our balance sheet. So we draw against an advance that we've made in the system almost immediately. And it sits off on the side, um, which is a, a really, again, it's a very clever structure. Yeah. Gotcha. And so let's just take a simple example. You draw down a thousand dollars, you make out the, the advance to a, a freelancer contractor. Um, and then as that's paid back, you're basically paying back route 66. And I guess what happens if there's a default by the freelancer, if you're okay sharing this? It actually depends on the type of default. Like uh, we've had so few, and because we're very good at, at underwriting, um, where at this point we might just buy it back and take the absorb the the risk. But ultimately, um, you know, they're on the hook. It's their money. They're trusting us to underwrite, and as long as it's within you know our underwriting criteria, uh, Route sixty six would stomach the loss. Interesting. Yeah, I guess that's kind of where I was going. Like, where's the the risk? Is it on your books or their books? That's that's interesting to know. Um, yeah. Cool, cool. And then I guess this this rate the round you just raised the five million equity and hundred million. This is just uh, you know where does it take you? Is it do you forecast having to raise multiple rounds or is this going to get the flywheel in motion? Yeah, I mean the flywheel is actually already spinning. You know, the raising the round. Uh, on the equity side was like, let's put some more firepower behind us on the operational side. Uh, and debt, we're going to be raising debt for the lifetime of our business. Um, that's just how the business works. And $100 million gives us a really nice bit of headroom for growth. But it's also a good stepping stone to like, you know, if you look at SoFi and some of the other, you know, lending platforms that have come out, you know, 100 million is one break point, 500 million is kind of your next break point. Then you mm. get to start to get over a billion. And you want to make sure you have a good partner at each of those break points because every time you're butting up against that ceiling, you know, you're kind of going into another echelon of debt and a new type of institution that is potentially going to lend to you. So for us, this was super important because Route 66, um, there's something in between hedge and uh, and like true institutional capital. And they have a lot of great relationships in the institutional capital space, such that when we need to, you know, refinance the line into something bigger, you know, probably that warm intro back to, you know, the earlier theme is going to come from them. And they're going to know exactly the capital provider that is going to be best suited to, to, to serve our needs. Very interesting. Are you? You can pass on this question if you choose. But at the Series A, are are you willing to share what your your metrics were? Kind of what your pitch was like at that that phase. Um, I don't want to share any specific metrics, but for our business, really the the, the important piece is growth in the advance volume. Mm -hmm. um, revenue, obviously, like as a fintech business, you know, at the very very high level, you've built a machine that is supposed to generate money. Uh, <laughs> so revenue is important, but really what's more important is capturing as much of sort of the freelancer advanced space as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, that's why having that big overhead, uh, debt facility was like really, really important for us and a massive win for the company. Is, is yours a competitive space? Are there people that are, you know, quickly copied you or, or I don't know, maybe you've copied someone else, not necessarily copied, but you know, are, uh, are there a lot of players in this space going after this market? How competitive is it? it? It's not super competitive right now, but not because there aren't there aren't players, more because of the size of the market. So, like freelancer earnings uh, add a little over three trillion dollars to the global economy annually, um, and there are a few sort of incumbent competitors that we don't really even 
like, you know, we don't sling mud, we more uh, cooperate. Uh, and then there's sort of the incumbents, which are your massive financial institutions that have no idea how to do what we do. So yeah. <laughs> we don't really view those guys as competitive either. So for now, um, we're in a very cooperative space. Um, now, in five years, I think you're going to start to see consolidation and all the fun stuff that happens when, you know, you have billion dollar businesses that are, um, that are coming out. So, yeah, exciting. Cool. Um, all right, let's see, I won't keep you too much longer, but, um, this is really interesting. What, um, you know, what advice would you give yourself if you were doing this all over again, uh, or advice to other people, maybe, you know, coming up in the FinTech space, um, anything we haven't covered? Um, it's going to take longer than you think. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, everything about, you know, FinTech and highly regulated industries, um, you can innovate and you can, you know, move fast and break some stuff, but there's some things that you just cannot break. And those things you have to treat very, very delicately. And you have to kind of go with the flow of, of the process and how it works. That means, your, you know, payments lawyer is probably going to be your best friend, uh, alongside your corporate counsel and your compliance officer and the like are going to be the people that really keep you out of jail and make sure that, (laughs) you know, you're not, you know, letting people in off of the OFAC watch list or, or what have you. And then the other thing is just take the money. Um, it takes, Mm -hmm. especially for a FinTech business, like cash is your fuel and don't over optimize on your round. Like, the alignment that I talked about, um, you know, earlier with my equity investors in particular, uh, I've been very lucky, frankly, that uh, that I've hit it off with all my investors so well. Um, and in the rare case where it's not a perfect fit, but you know, it's going to help you get to the next level. That's okay. You know, just make sure that you are focusing on the right metrics and that whatever fuel you're taking, whatever capital you're you're taking in, is going to help you get to whatever that next level might be. So I, I guess my advice to myself is um, slow down, be thoughtful, um, and you know it's going to take longer than you think. Yeah, good stuff. All right, Johnny, if people want to learn more, it's uh, qwill.co, is that correct? qwil.co, yes. Oh, qwil.co, and any call to action, anything you're uh, – you want to plug or, you know, open job recs or anything you want to, any, anything you want to plug? Yeah, we're always hiring software engineers. And also if there are any founders of marketplace businesses or businesses that leverage freelancers, um, we can provide a liquidity solution and help you pay out all your freelancers globally. So hit us up on the website. And if you mention that, um, that you heard me on this, uh, I'll give you a special rate. <laughs> all right. That's great. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Good luck. Uh, continued success. And we'll catch you after your next round. Sound good? Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. All right. Cheers. Bye.